Bienvenidos a todos. Uh, let's see here. Mi nombre es Miguelito Murphy. Um, a veces yo recuerdo las palabras de español, pero not always. Uh, y mi esposa es un maestro de español, so she gave me some things that I could read to you. <laughs> No se puede vivir sin amar o sin ella, sin ella. Uh, bienvenidos a todos a Loyola y esta presentación tan muy importante. Les agradecemos, panelistas estima, estimadas, por su trabajo importante y por aceptar nuestra invitación. Gracias especialmente a Héctor, doctor. Uh, buena suerte <laughs> y vaya con Dios. <laughs> <laughs> Muchas gracias a todos. Here's Ellie Shermer. Ellie's going to uh, give us a formal welcome to our. <laughs> Thanks. We, start, we have a strange division of power for this long. We started this in the spring, and here we are today. And, and we're actually not done yet, as I'll explain. So thanks to everyone uh, here this afternoon for our last day, but hardly the least important for this uh, symposium on the Global 68 Days of Past and Present. As Dr. Murphy said, I'm Ellie Shermer, I'm a history faculty member. And I'd like to thank everyone. We, I feel like we did think everyone possible last night um, during Dr. Borg's inspiring keynote. But I want to add one more special word of thanks, because it was my great pleasure to collaborate with everyone involved, but especially Dr. Michael Murphy, um, whose energy and enthusiasm, and I think Hector, you must agree with this too, is actually inspiring to really sort of take the plunge to do this. And the wonderful Helix Center staff, but I really want to thank Megan Toomey, who only joined the staff on October 1st and plunged right in into the last final weeks of this. And I'm not sure how you did it, um, <laughs> uh, but I, you did it. You certainly did. Um, and the, the, the key thing about this is that this is not just for these three days, but we had um, the Berrigan Week earlier in the semester. We have had an ongoing film series. It's going to keep going, Planet of the Apes, with Dr. Murphy himself on October 30th, on Tuesday night. And there's pizza. Um, and the final thing that we're going to conclude this is with the Behind the Tweets midterm postmortem that I'm going to post. Part of this Behind the Tweets series I've been doing for the last couple of years. But this final day it really speaks to what we had envisioned for this symposium, something beyond scholarship. How could we not include a folk mass, as was done this afternoon, with Dr. Murphy's brilliant tambourine and some of the Hank Sitter staff singing the, singing the songs too, and which epitomizes what Vatican II made possible, even if we put the church at the crossroads in the 60s, as we talked about third, uh, Wednesday night. But that was a way to really engage students the real focus of this final day. Because even though all of our panel panels have emphasized that the young, the old, of course the middle aged, were energized around the world by 68, no matter whether their politics were far right, far left, or somewhere in the middle, that fact doesn't change the fact that 68 was, uh, or was termed the year of the students. As many of our audience members pointedly spoke about on, uh, on their, during these two days of the symposium, we've heard so much about what it was like to be young at that time. And we'll hear more about some of those young people in the first panel on Mexico in 68, I'm sure. But Michael and I also wanted to include students from the 60s and today to give them a chance to talk about their experiences as activists then and now. And then thinking especially about some of the incredible questions we've gotten from students about what they should be doing now. And hopefully that's a way for us to end this symposium. Keeping us thinking about why the past seems so present now and of course, how that might help us consider what comes next or should come next, especially with a very important election looming. One of many, actually, that has and will make headlines in 2018, like the contest of Brazil, Mexico, France, Germany, the not-so-united kingdom, that have all made us wonder whether the age of the 60s, to think about Dr. Borg's you know, uh, last night, is coming to an end, and what brave new world uh, might be forged next from the energy, enthusiasm, and hard work of the young, old, and middle aged. And on that note, i got to turn it over to Dr. Hector Garcia. Uh, good afternoon, buenas tardes, bienvenidas y bienvenidos a todas y todos. It's good afternoon to all of you, of all gender expressions. I want to give thanks again to the Hang Center. You do so much. The staff, the... Filming, me, sure, the filming oh, sorry, I, I forgot course. about this. Yeah, the, Hang, Hang, uh, the Hang Center does so much. Um, the staff, 
Again, you do bombard us with emails, but that's important. The director who approached me a few months ago and other colleagues as well about brainstorming, how to bring in other parts of the world, globally speaking, thinking Chicago locally about 1968. So without the director, uh, Michael Miguelito Murphy, this symposium on 1968 wouldn't be possible. These conversations in 1968 have been Chicago land bound. No, Chicagolandia is, is how I describe it in, in, in Spanish. I've been at different venues, different locations, universities, some more cultural that speak directly to 1968. And for us as Mexicans and Mexicanistas, it's, it's critical. For us, there is not, was it important? Yes, very, very important. 1968 is the year of the first Olympics in Latin America, the end of October of 1968. And Mexico is kind of that bridge, kind of what Turkey does with the rest of that part of Asia. Me Mexico is to, to Latin America from, from my perspective. I'm also part of Lit and Luz, and this year was focused a lot on connection and assembly. And we had wonderful roundtable discussions, and one particularly on the Chicago Democratic Convention, and then the, the uh, 2 de Octubre, the 2nd of October of 1968, which is pivotal. I lastly do want to thank all of you who are present here. It's not easy on a Friday afternoon to make that bold decision to leave your home or leave wherever you're comfortable snacking or why not una siesta. But I think for students, for those of you that are here, I want to thank you even more. I think it's important for you to take full advantage of these spaces and ask questions and knock on our doors. And if you write an email and we don't reply as professors, forgive us, keep coming back. It's important. Really, this conversation is, is really geared to you from, from my standpoint. This um, panel discussion titled The Mexican Spirit in 1968 Lives On, El 2 de Octubre No Se Olvida, um, was put together by myself and then connecting with Dr. Gemma uh, Santa Maria and then my bold move to invite el Dr. Sejo Guayo Quesada. And when he said yes, I was ecstatic. I was very ecstatic. I'll start first with uh, Dr. Gemma Santa Maria and then she will speak and then we will have the pleasure of Dr. Sergio Aguayo, and then we will have a session, a Q&A session, uh, for the last 15, 20 minutes. Um, these introductions are a little bit longer than what's expected at certain type of venues, symposia like these, like this one, I'm, I'm sorry. But I believe it's important for you to fully understand how special it is to have, to my left, um, a new colleague and new friend here at, uh, at Loyola, and, and in, a professor of mine from 20 years ago when he was a Tinker Fellow at the University of Chicago. So it's, it's a nice mix here. Uh, Dr. Gemma Santa Maria, her PhD is from the New School for Social Research, is an assistant professor of Latin American history at, Loy at Loyola University, Chicago. Previously, she was the 2017-2018 visiting fellow at Notre Dame's Kellogg Institute for International Studies. In Mexico, or Mexico, previously, Dr. Santa Maria was assistant professor and director of the undergraduate program in international relations at the Instituto Tecnológico Autónomo de, uh, de México, ITAM, as well as visiting fellow at the Center for U.S.-Mexican Studies at the University of California, San Diego, a very important center for those research topics. Her research analysis analyzes, excuse me, the history of Latin American processes of state building across the 20th and 21st centuries with a particular attention to questions of violence, crime, justice, and the rule of law. Doctora Santa Maria is working on a book manuscript titled, quote, In the Vortex of Violence, Lynching, Extralegal Justice, and the State in Post-Revolutionary Mexico, which traces the social and historical motives behind the persistence of lynching. She has also authored numerous articles and chapters as well as reports for the United Nations Development Program, the Woodrow Wilson Center for International Scholars, and the Norwegian Peacebuilding Resource Center. In addition to her PhD, she holds a master's in gender and social policy from the London School of Economics. Today, Dr. Gemma Santa Maria will be speaking directly uh, uh, from a book chapter, which I have right here, Mexico Beyond 1968. Let me read the title. It's, it's, a, it's a provocative one. Mexico Beyond 1968, Revolutionaries, Radicals, and Repression During the Global 60s and Subversive 70s. And she will focus uh, on mobs, riots, and student violence in the 1960s and 70s in Puebla, Mexico. Muchas gracias.
Thank you. Uh, is this fine for the recording? Yeah? OK, excellent. Um, so thank you, welcome, and thank you for the opportunity of being here today, being part of this conference. Thank you to the organizers, and, in, and especially to my colleague, uh, Professor uh, Hector Garcia, for inviting me to participate in this dialogue and share this table with Professor Sergio Aguayo, a scholar whose contributions to our understanding of the past and present history of violence in Mexico have been meaningful and instrumental. I feel truly honored to be here with you today. Um, my presentation will be based on an ongoing research project which deals with the history of violence uh, that anti-communist ideologies and representations of youth as a source of danger generated during the 1960s in the state of Puebla. Part of this research was published in an edited volume that uh, uh, Hector mentioned just now, uh, coordinated by Jaime Pensado and Enrique Ochoa. Shane Gillingham, uh, who is here with us and was here yesterday presenting in this conference, also contributed to this volume. Um, my, my paper is connected in various ways to the theme of this panel, which deals with the events leading up to the Tlatelolco massacre that took place on October 2nd of 1968 in Mexico City, an event in which hundreds of unarmed students and youth were killed by the Mexican army and by the state security forces. The paper reconstructs the climate of anti-communism and criminalization of youth that pervaded at Mexico at the time, and refers to the ways in which the Mexican state, both in overt and covert ways, contributed to the vulnerability of young people in general and leftist students in particular. My work, however, is distinct in two ways. Um, first, it turns our attention to the political context characterizing other localities outside of Mexico City during the 1960s by focusing specifically on the state of Puebla. And second, it shifts the emphasis from a state-centered understanding of violence during this period, one in which the state uh, is understood as the main perpetrator of the violence against students and against youth, to one in which students themselves, particularly students from the right, but also from the left, as well as local communities, also take part in the violence that impacted young activists and students during this time. In this sense, uh, my aim is, on the one hand, to provincialize Mexico's Cold War, if you will, by looking at this particular state of Puebla, um, by highlighting the particular trajectory of anti-communism and conservatism in this state, and on the other hand, to pluralize our understanding of the broad range of competing actors that shaped the organization of violence during these decades beyond the Mexican state and its security forces. I advance two main arguments. Um, First, that Puebla's students' recourse to kidnappings, hijacking of buses, riots, and street fights reflected a climate wherein violence constituted an effective means to press demands and advance political interest. Even when it was publicly condemned, the use of violence as a means to engage in politics was neither exceptional nor limited to the students. As a matter of fact, violence was condoned by Puebla's public opinion so long as the situation was deemed appropriate. In other words, as long as violence was used either to restore peace, order, morality, or bring order to the state. Secondly, I argue that despite discourses that claim that student and youth activism were a byproduct of a communist infiltration or a foreign exotic idea that aim at destabilizing the state and the nation, evidence su suggests that students' demands were based on local realities and needs, such as the students' interest to democratize Puebla's politics, as well as to reform and modernize Puebla's uh, public university, the University Autonomous of Puebla. Despite of this, conservative and right-wing students use this anti-communist narrative as a means to assert themselves as authentic and patriotic actors that needed to resist a deceitful and foreign left. So in the following minutes, uh, because I'm aware of, of the time, um, I will provide you just with a few examples of these, the discourses that contributed con criminalizing youth in Puebla and of the violence perpetrated by and against student activists from the left and the right. So, on April 6th of 1961, a student protest took place against the implementation of a new telephone service that, according to protesters, would make customers pay an extra fee for additional phone calls. Despite its local nature, newspaper reports framed this protest in the broader context of the Cold War. 
Echoing what other newspapers reported, El Sol de Puebla, a local newspaper, stressed that demonstrators against the new telephone service had pronounced provocative speeches against the United States and in favor of Fidel Castro, and had afterwards attacked some of his buildings and public property. According to the same article, a group of authentic students met with people from the newspaper after the incident. In the meeting, the students allegedly expressed that external elements had infiltrated the student movement and provoked the damages. Echoing this opinion, another editorial referred to how authentic university students were busy at this time of the year, preparing and performing theater plays, developing literacy campaigns, and training for the next pentathlon competitions. In other words, according to these and other accounts, the so-called authentic students of Puebla were not involved in politics, and less so in politics that ended up in vandalism. In reference to the telephone service demonstration, an op-ed published at the Washington Post referred to the usually excitable and easy to mold character of the student body in Latin American countries and described it as a fertile ground for skillful communist agitators. As this narrative suggests, student protesters who engaged in provocative politics were either unauthentic or non-representative of the student body or were considered easy prey for the specter of communism haunting Puebla. Public opinion considered youth susceptible not only to communist ideas, but also to immoral practices, ranging from vagrancy and the use of drugs to libertine behavior. Newspapers condemned the use of drugs amongst youth and referred to it as a direct cause of violent and deviant behavior amongst youngsters. They furthermore warned about the presence of so-called hippies in the state who were supposedly responsible for spreading sexual diseases and vices. The moral and political anxieties related to the Cold War reached a boiling point in Puebla during a student rally organized in support of the Cuban Revolution on April of 1961. The students had joined a rally to condemn the involvement of the United States during the Bay of Pigs invasion. Approximately 250 students joined the protest shouting, Cuba, yes, Yankees, no. By and large, most newspaper articles described these students as professional agitators who had incited violence and promoted acts of vandalism against private property. Influential members of the Catholic Church echoed this representation of youth as a source of instability. The director of the Social Secretariat of Mexico commented on the student protest in an address given to the church and the Christian family movement of Puebla. Echoing the conservative reports in the newspapers, he expressed, we should not close our eyes. Communism wants power in order to impose its dictatorship in Mexico and the world. He reminded his audience that Catholics should unequivocally embrace the cry, Catholicism, yes, communism, no, and urge poblanos to come in defense of the liberty, dignity, and traditions of the homeland. Velázquez's speech was just a prelude to a massive anti-communist rally taking place a few days after. That rally brought together hundreds of people, including university students and high school students from private high schools, who denounced not only the university's communist infiltration, but also the red invasion in Mexico and other Latin American countries. During the rally, demonstrators shouted, long live Christ the King, in addition to the slogan, Catholicism yes, communism no. The former cried, Long live Christ the King, with unequivocal Cristero undertones, the, the, war, the Cristero war that took place in 19, 19, at the end of the 1920s in Mexico, appealed to a strand of anti-communist ideology that preceded the Cold War and that was rooted in Puebla's own trajectory of conservative and reactionary politics. After a group of university students opposing the demonstration arrived at the rally, a violent confrontation broke out between the two opposing factions. Attacks on private schools were perpetrated the following days by liberal students and by leftist students, followed and retaliated by right-wing students that also attacked public schools. By the year 1961, the student population of Puebla was effectively divided into two factions. The Carolinos, composed by liberals and leftist students, and the right-wing student or body organized in the anti-communist university front, uh, known as FUA in Spanish. Whereas the former defended the observance of Article 3 of the Constitution, which guaranteed that, public, uh, that education should be, should be public and lay, the latter proclaimed that the university curricula should reflect the values of Christian civilization and supported the anti-communist campaign promoted, promoted by the church. Although ignored or overlooked by the conservative press, the demands to secularize and modernize the university were central to the student movement in Puebla. And I 
carried out interviews with students, I mean, with people that were students at the time, and that's, that's what they reflect upon. It was these demands to secularize and modernize the university, and not communism, what gave cohesiveness to liberal and leftist students. Yet, right-wing students and other conservative actors in Puebla insisted on superimposing the communist anti-communist schema. The conflict surrounding the reform of the university will last for several months. On May of 1961, the Archbishop of Puebla intervened in the student conflict by devoting an entire pastoral letter to the issue of communism. In the letter, which was meant to be read in all of Puebla's Catholic churches during the Sunday sermon, the Archbishop warned his flock about the imminent threat posed by communism. He stated, and I quote, Let's raise our boys with all energy in defense of the Christian civilization and of the highest values it has. Let us defend the family, the human person, liberty, order, authority, religion, our motherland. In the following years, there will be a series of events that show how leftist and liberal students became more engaged with social and popular demands in the state that went beyond the university. Although these demands had nothing to do with a foreign communist plot, but rather with Puebla's own social and political realities, they continue to be represented as such. And I should say here, I mean, I do not have time to develop this here in my presentation, but I can discuss this in the Q&A. Uh, there were increasingly the student movement, the leftists and liberal students increasingly became involved with the Communist Party, with the Mexican Communist Party. So whereas those communist connections were not true for the first part of the 1960s, by the end of the 1960s, they were true, and, and especially during the 1970s in Puebla. So I'm going to cover now this particular event, uh, which I think is, again, very telling of the climate of anti-communism that existed at the time. Um, and this is a lynching of five university workers from the Autonomous University of Puebla that took place in the small town of San Miguel Canoa in Puebla on September 14 of 1968. I mean, this lynching illuminates how representations of students and youth as dangerous elements had reached various local communities beyond the capital of Puebla. The event took place only a few weeks before the Tlatelolco massacre. To be precise, only two weeks before the October 2nd, uh, 1968 student massacre. This violent lynching uh, came to epitomize one of the most violent episodes of the Mexico's Cold War era. The lynching is further considered a defining episode in the regional history of Puebla's student movement, as well as, and, and it is central in the collective memory that exists of it. The five university workers who were lynched were passing by the town of San Miguel Canoa in their way to go hiking to a mountain called La Malinche. The workers who were all in their early or mid-twenties were wrongly accused of being communist students by the people of San Miguel. The accusation instigated a large group of villagers, thought to be in the hundreds, to capture and subsequently beat the workers. Two of the victims died from lethal machete injuries, while, the, while, while three survived after ongoing a long process of physical and psychological recovery. And I have had the privilege of interviewing one of the survivors of this lynching. In addition to the university workers, Luc Lucas Garcia, a villager who had agreed to provide shelter to these university workers, was also killed as a result of the lynching. A member of an independent union that had connections with the Mexican Communist Party, Lucas Garcia was a critical opponent of the town's Catholic priest, Enrique Mesa Perez. For his part, the priest had strong connections to the local pre-party and ruled the town of San Miguel Canoa under an authoritarian grip. In his sermons, the priest promoted an image of unionized workers as communists as, and infidels, and referred to students as a threat for the material and spiritual integrity of the community. Just a few days before the lynching, university students had indeed been in Kanoa and held a meeting with local workers, community sympathizers, and other residents of the town. The five university workers, who were neither students nor communists, would bear the consequences of the students' incursion into this town. The presence of students in this small town uh, confirms that the student movement in Puebla had transformed from an exclusively urban and university-based activism to a broader political movement with a strong ties with popular peasant and workers' organizations. It further reaffirms the fact that the students were indeed connected to communist organizations, but these leftist organizations were homegrown. They were not byproducts of Soviet or Cuban infiltration, as widely claimed by the press. So, and, and this event goes again, shows clearly that, um, that 
a narrative centered only on the violence executed by the state is not enough. No, I mean there were violence. Violence was perpetrated also by other actors. No, including in this case, this local community or the the people that participated in the lynching in, in Kanoa. And we can talk about what it means to pluralize this story of violence. Um, in this presentation, and I'm concluding now, I have sought to analyze the politics of violence characterizing the student movement in 1960s Puebla. Specifically, I have aimed at both provincializing and pluralizing our understanding of Puebla's student violence during the height of the Cold War period. Despite an official rhetoric that tended to represent students, particularly from the left, as prone to being manipulated by foreign and exotic elements, I have argued that student activism and the recourse to violence were grounded on local demands and regional politics, be it in the need to reform and modernize the university or the, or the demand to attend issues of social justice among Puebla's popular sectors, the discourses and actions of leftist students were informed by regional conditions. Furthermore, a student's use of violence refle reflected a political climate wherein violence was seen as a legitimate means to advance political demands. Puebla's public opinion condemned student violence and countercultural practices, but at the same time, it condoned immoral behavior and called upon a greater presence of the police and the military in order to repress students. Through practices of covert and overt repression, Puebla's authorities and political elites added to the violence characterizing the student movement at this time. Thank you very much. Buenas tardes de nuevo. Welcome for those that walked in a little bit later, a little later, after we started. My apologies. Now for El Dr. Sergio Aguayo Quesada. He has been a full professor at El Colegio de México, Centro de Estudios Internacionales, since 1977, where he coordinates the seminar on violence and peace, and recently published a report investigating two mass killings in Mexico by gangs in the drug trade, and the need for the United States and Mexico to join together to fight organized crime, and why it has not happened. Dr. Aguayo's academic training and public experiences have led to an outstanding career as a public intellectual concerned with the roots of violence in Mexico and long-term solutions. He has taught at various universities in Mexico, the United States, including the University of Chicago. He was a Tinker Fellow. He was my professor there, and also in Europe. Since 2014, he has been affiliated with the FXB Center for Health and Human Rights at Harvard School of Public Health. He has published close to 30 books, maybe more. One is um, 1968, Los, bueno, I'll say it in Spanish, 1968, Los Archivos de la Violencia. 1968, The Archives of Violence. That's the book I believe he was writing when you were my professor. So I remember that. 18 monographs, about 100 academic articles or book chapters, and close to 1,500 journalistic publications. He was a founding member of the newspaper La Jornada and the magazine Este País. He writes a weekly column in La Reforma, as well as 14 other newspapers. Since March 2001, he has been a member of Prime Plano, Primer Plano, perdón, uh, Canal 11, it's like PBS if you want, equivalent, a weekly TV talk show. 2014, he founded the influential seminar on violence and peace that conducts research, organizes courses for public officials and victim organizations, and has a monthly public discussion with the protagonist of War and Peace. And it continues. Dr. Sergio Aguayo has been invited as an, inv uh, as an invited lecturer for the National Defense College and the Center of Higher Naval Studies, uh, which are the top research institutes within the Mexican Armed Forces. Today, Dr. Sergio Aguayo Quesada will be speaking about his last publication, which is two weeks old, three weeks old? Something like that. Very recent. Very recent. It's available on Amazon as a, as a, is it a, not what's it called, the, uh, the platform where it's not printed? Kindle. It's Kindle. Is it which, in English, Espanol, or it's English? English. English. Yeah. And the title of that book, and he will highlight some of what he's presented there, and it's titled, and I'll leave it at that, uh, Mexico 68, The Students, The President, and the CIA. Okay. Um. 
very generous presentation by Hector, and I thank the Hank Center, Mike, Megan, that has been my godmother uh, through internet. Of course, Hector Garcia and Gemma Santa Maria. I have written three books, about 68, and uh, yes, I was finishing the book when I came to Chicago, University of Chicago, to teach the first book. And uh, the first two books, actually, I concentrated in two actors, the government, the regime, and the forces that appeared in 1968, the student forces, but it was more than that, that uh, wanted a peaceful transformation. And in that regard, I want to make a comment about Hema's paper, I enjoy it, because it illustrates how difficult it is to come to definitive conclusions about the meaning of 68, because whereas in Puebla, I believe the elites wanted uh, that force be used against the students, communist students, in, Me in Mexico City, some opinion polls that I found in 68 found that there was a massive disapproval of the use of force in Tlatelolco by the population, not by the elites. So it means that we still have to dig further and further to establish what was the meaning of Tlatelolco for uh, uh, Mexico, for the students, for the transition, for the government, and also how it was, what impact it had in uh, uh, Puebla or Guadalajara, my hometown, in which 68 led to guerrillas, the appearance of guerrillas, and of cartels that established in, Mex in Guadalajara in part because they were given protection by the dead squads that were created to execute guerrillas. So it is a complicated history, but uh, in spite of that, I, what I want just to establish is that 68, the 68 movement, it's important because it is the first time that the popular movement, national transformation of the regime started in the capital, and that movement wanted the change to be to take to be achieved in a peaceful way. Our previous transformations, independence, reform, revolution, were very violent struggles. Mexico is a violent society. I mean, it is not only the students or the elites. No, no, we are a violent society. It has many reasons. I'm not going to enter into that, but I'm going to concentrate in the third book. The third book, I incorporate a new ingredient, the role of the external actor. What was the, what was the role played by Cuba, the Soviet Union, the US, the CIA, the embassy? And when one incorporates that angle, then one has to reinterpret the whole history. And that's what I'm going to do, taking the book as a pretext, but I'm going to incorporate new elements because that book, I mean, if you want to obtain it, it's in Amazon and that's that. But I keep accumulating evidence. And therefore, um, what I'm going to, to do is to take the 668 first to establish what was the role of the external actors, mainly the CIA, not only, and then to draw some conclusions that are important for the present. Because 68 still is giving lessons to us all the time, in many ways. Gustavo Díaz Ordaz was the president of Mexico at that time, that we know what we don't know was that the second most important person in the regime was an American, Winston Scott. Winston Scott had been the head of the CIA in Mexico since 1956. And he had become the main 
advisors in intelligence affairs to the presidents, mainly to Adolfo Lopez Mateos and Gustavo Díaz Ordaz. He had the trust of the Mexican presidents. As a matter of fact, the two, these two presidents and some others were in the payroll of the CIA. They were agents of the CIA, and I'm going to show you the evidence. Now, they were so friends that uh, the president Adolfo López Mateos and Gustavo Díaz Ordaz accepted to be the witnesses of the civil wedding of Winston Scott uh, with another CIA, CIA agent, J Janet Scott, who was the wife of another CIA agent. I mean, <laughs> and the triangle, if, you, if we have time, I can tell you because it's an extraordinary story of uh, love and betrayal and espionage and all that. But nevertheless, what was remarkable was that the president and the minister of the interior accepted to go and sign on December 62 in the wedding, and they accepted that that ceremony was published in the most important newspaper of the time, Excelsior. I mean, you cannot see it from here, but it is the wedding. All the cover of the two presidents as agents of the CIA were blown, which is Remarkable. It is one of the golden rules of espionage that you don't uh, expose your sources. And here it comes that the CIA, uh, the chief of the station, was blowing the, the cover. And there was a reason, of course, because he knew very well the, how the political system worked, and he was being sued for adulterers, for adultery by the husband of his wife. So he knew that if a Mexican judge saw the act in the, the paper in which uh, the president signed as a witness, or the best man, uh, nobody, no judge will send him to jail or to whatever. But that's another matter. What I obtained, and this cannot be shown in the book, is a film about the wedding, a short film that I'm going to show you to you. I put some music that is, I, I edited. Sweet lover, I that I love you. Tell me, do you love me too? I confess that I need you, honest I do. Every single moment in your eyes I read it's a strange thing But you live in my eyes Will your eyes really chase me Making me blue Making me blue Tu traición Yo la llevo aquí muy Now, it's impressive, isn't it? Especially because uh, Adolfo López Mateos has declared himself of extreme left within the Constitution. 
I mean, uh, all this is uh, it's part of Mexican history. It, everything fits when you uh, put the pieces where they belong. I'm not going to enter into that, but what does this mean for 68? And good pastures is the second, was the second uh, uh, in the CIA station in Mexico. And she wrote a book about the Mexico City station history. And that uh, was uh, uh, delivered a few years ago as part of the research on the Kennedy assassination because the assassin of President, uh, alleged assassin of President Kennedy was in Mexico. And there is a sort of, uh, in, uh, there was and there is a lot of interest about the Mexican angle in that assassination. I'm not going to enter into that. But in some parts of this uh, history, it is clearly stated, and here it is the transcription of the two previous uh, paragraphs, that in January 1964, Headquarters approved and furnished equipment, radio central, and four auto automobile radios for Gustavo Diaz Ordaz campaign. Besides, the CIA gave, gave Ordaz $400 per month as a subsidy from December 1963 to November 1964. Apparently, it was to pay his bodyguards during his campaign tours. This was in addition to a regular salary of, and the, the exact amount we don't know, um, per month paid to Litempo One, the Azordas, as a station support agent of the CIA. Thus, our president was a CIA agent, paid, period. What does that mean? That's another matter, but let's go to, six, to 68. Winston Scott and Gustavo Díaz Ordaz were, were cold warriors, very deeply anti-communist. Díaz Ordaz was from Puebla. So I'm not surprised that they had this kind of ideas, that, uh, the ideas that Gemma explained to us. So what I have been able to establish was that Winston Scott was very influential in the th interpretation that Díaz Ordaz gave to the students' movement. Because there were two schools. It is a native movement with uh, local root, with, with local roots, or is a part of a plot of the communist, international communism. And uh, Winston Scott influenced Díaz Ordaz. And Díaz Ordaz used Winston Scott to present to Washington the, the hypothesis that the students were part of a communist uh, conspiracy. The first uh, cable sent by Winston Scott at 12 o'clock on October 2nd is very clear. The first shots were fired by the students from the Chihuahua apartments. Most of the students present on the speaker's platform were armed, one with a submachine gun. The troops were only answering the fire from the students. That is, he's fully supporting the thesis of the government, which was a lie. I mean, that was not the case. The snipers that fired to the crowd were elements of the uh, elite uh, arm unit uh, from the um, elite group from the uh, from the army that. Uh, oh, obey only to the president, Estado Mayor Presidencial. Three days, three days later, he wrote, Winston Scott, to Washington, the guns used were new and had their numbers filled off, filed off. The Castro and Chinese communist groups were at the center of the effort. The Soviet communists had to come along to avoid the charge of being chicken. So it's very clear, I mean, he's saying that the Soviets, the Cubans, and the Chinese were providing weapons to the students. The White House, the, the National Security Council, uh, reacted with the intensity, saying, 
what are you saying? G give us the proofs, because it was extremely, uh, it was a provocation in case, not at the level of the missile uh, in, uh, crisis in Cuba, but it was a provocation to, to deliver weapons to a group to uh, try to overthrow the Mexican government, an ally of the U.S. And of course, Winston Scott had to say, well, I don't have the evidence. And one American diplomat wrote uh, sarcastically, Scott presented 15 different and sometimes flatly contradictory versions of what happened at Tlatelolco. He was discredited. And um, the State Department was more sober, and some sectors of the CIA in saying this Mexican student movement was local, was native. Of course, there were communists. There were. But they didn't have the influence that were. I mean, here you have to balance if uh, who is to blame for uh, the bombs sent to the Democrats all over the, this country, if the fake news or uh, the inflammatory rhetoric of some politicians. I mean, that is the equivalent. You have to decide who is to blame. I mean, the, and uh, Winston Scott was removed. And uh, Jefferson Morley, who wrote a book, Our Man in Mexico, excellent book about him, um, end with the line, the puppet master had become a puppet. That is, Winston Scott ended being at the service of the Mexican government. And that was the case, by the way. He was, uh, he ended his career six months later in June 1969. End of that part of the story. Now, what is the meaning of this? What, how are we going to interpret besides saying, oh, the Mexican president was a CIA agent? Well, from a structural perspective, the real lesson is that Mexican presidents did not have an intelligence service of, its own, of their own. They depended on the CIA and the FBI. Basically, I mean, they, didn't, they were at the mercy of what the CIA and the FBI, FBI told them about uh, who were the enemies of Mexico, what was the role of the Cuba, the Soviet Union, or whatever, or who were the, the internal enemies. Um, and by the way, Jesuits in the capital were very important in the movement, and some sectors of the Catholic Church that uh, have been influenced by the Vatican Council too, but that's another story. But uh, Operation Interception, September 69. It was important because the U.S. closed the border in September without letting the Mexican president know. And uh, I, don't, I don't have the time. What is important about this operation, I'm going to take a quotation from the New York Times, was that if the Mexican government did not comply with the demands on the part of the Nixon, from the, uh, of the Nixon administration, the Nixon administration would provide the names that of 20 important Mexicans that were involved in drug trafficking. So Gordon Liddy, the one of Watergate, later wrote his memoirs, and he said Operation Interception was an exercise in international extortion, pure simple and effective. And Mexico agreed to follow the strategy decided in the US uh, against the production and traffic of drugs, against organized crime in general. That's the consequence of, the Mexi of, of Mexico not having its own intelligence agencies, because here is a question, is, it goes to the, to, the, to the bottom line of the exercise of power. If you have, as a, as a government, the capacity to decide who presents a risk for your country. In that case, Nixon and the Operation Interception was a risk because it imposed on Mexico, a strategy that has not 
work that has not functioned. One of the requests of that uh, operation was that the Mexico involve the army or send the army to fight the, the cartels. That has been wrong for many reasons. I don't have the time to, the, to work on that, but if you are, uh, have an interest, I can go back. Uh, in any event, the Diaz Ordaz government uh, comply, and the names of the 20 agents of the, or the 20 uh, Mexican high or important Mexicans that were involved in organized crime were never uh, delivered by the U.S. government. We don't know who these people were. Now, why was Mexico dependent? Here is the question. I mean, I'm, I'm moving back and forth because this president, Miguel Alemán, decided he wanted an organization like the FBI. So he ordered this person, Carlos Iserrano, organize an FBI. He asked, the CIA, the CIA was created in uh, March 47, March, April 47. The FBI had been present in Mexico since 1932, 33. So he asked them to train the people. And they trained the agents and they teach them how to infiltrate, spy, torture, execute. By they, but they didn't teach those agents on how to produce intelligence. So you have an agency that produces massive amounts of information that they don't know how to process. It's like a, an archive that uh, has not been tamed, because you know archives have to be tamed, have to be seduced. Uh, yes, it's a, it, is, it is, you establish a love-hate relationship with an archive. And uh, you must tame, you must understand the logic of those who organize or produce the papers in order to make sense of what's in those papers. Mexico didn't have, because Carlos Serrano was involved in drug traffic. I obtained, he's one of the founders, founders of organized crime in Mexico. That I can say now. I, I have the evidence. This is one small piece. I'm writing a book now, my next project. I have been working for four years. It's a comparative study of the American mobs and Chicago. Here was created a commission in 1931. Of, in November, when uh, after uh, Al Capone was sent to prison, they met here to create the commission that uh, controlled organized crime all over the US and the Mexican cartels. So if uh, in the US, Al Capone, uh, Lucky Luciano, Major Lansky are the creators of the, the architects of organized crime in this country, in Mexico, it was Abelardo L. Rodriguez, general, governor of Baja California, and Carlos Serrano. And look what the CIA say. Well, you, you cannot read it. I put it here. Serrano, an unscrupulous man, is actively engaged in various illegal enterprises, such as the narcotics traffic. He's considered astute, intelligent, and personable. He said to aspire to the presidency of the republic. It's a fascinating history why he couldn't make it. But uh, he tried, to, well, I don't know if he, but some of his people tried to smuggle 63 cans of opium through Nuevo Laredo, and they were caught with his car, with the Cadillac of Carlos Serrano. And then Drew Pearson in the Washington Post published an expose in 1948, and that, no, yes, 1948 because that was 1946 when the opium cans were discovered in 1948. That's a fascinating story, because organized crime has to be understood from a binational perspective. Criminal violence have, and political violence have to be understood from a, with a binational perspective. Otherwise, it doesn't make sense. You lose 
the full understanding. Rex Applegate, he was from the OSS, uh, CIA. He was one of the trainers of the Directorate of Federal Security. And by the way, I mean, the CIA wrote that, but the, the American government never said anything to the Mexican government about uh, the engagement of Carlos Serrano in, the, in drug trafficking because he was this, the closest ally of President Miguel Alemán. Now let's move to the presidency of Andrés Manuel López Obrador. Two lessons. The first one. From the perspective of uh, accountability, human rights, and so on, is the U.S. government or some, are the, some agencies of the U.S. government in specific events can be held accountable for human rights massacres in Mexico? That is, Winston Scott can be judged in absentia for creating this ambience for the decision to order the assassination of innocent people or not? It's a relevant question because there is evidence that the, some U.S. agencies keep committing those kinds of mistakes that have as a consequence massacres of Mexican nationals. The case of the Allende and Monterrey, the execution of hundreds of people in Coahuila in 2010, was the consequence of a failure on the part of the DEA in the, in the, in the handling of sensitive information. It's a relevant question. Of course, it's nobody wants to touch that angle because it's, can you imagine? I mean, the Mexican government, I don't think, is going to make it. Second, Mexico and the U.S. have changed a lot, and the relation between the two countries have changed a lot. However, we have not changed in terms of the dependency Mexico has on U.S. intelligence. We are still dependent, like was the case in 68, or 69, or the 70s, or the 80s. And I'm going to give you a small evidence of that. Those of us who study security know that uh, what is uh, important is uh, what you put in the risk agenda in the threat agenda. And the country must be very careful in, in deciding which uh, threats you are going to put. I mean, terrorism, of course, I mean, for the US after September 11 is, is, under, is uh, uh, understandable. Let's see how the two countries put uh, use uh, the risk agenda. Well, this is a shield of the Center for Investigation and National Security. That's irrelevant for, for my argument today. This is the assessment of threats in the world of uh, is, uh, February of this year. It is uh, prepared by the directors of uh, national intelligence of this country and sent to Congress every year. Based, the countries in the Caribbean basin that threaten the U.S. in order of importance are Mexico, Central America, Colombia, Cuba, and Haiti. Look, Mexico is at the top. It's a, it's a criteria of the American establishment and intelligence. It is not my opinion. It's, it's what is in that, in that report. Now look at the National Security Program 2014-2019, Mexican. Enrique Peña Nieto. Mexican issues included, oh, this is, there is a mistake. The U.S. included Mexican issues in his risk, risk agenda, violence, corruption, impunity, migration. Now let's look at the National Security Program, Mexican. Look at the international organizations they list, 12. There is not one American 
organizational agency. Does that mean that the U.S. cannot harm Mexican national security? Or is it that our intelligence apparatus is not including the U.S.? Because being a student of U.S.-Mexican relations, I would argue that the National Rifle Association is a candidate uh, to be included in an agenda of risks. Not the U.S. as such, but the National Rifle Association because they protect the smugglers that sell weapons to the cartels that are killing Mexicans. I mean, it, it is like the, the U.S. including the cartels. Of course, it's logical that they include the Mexican cartels, the Chapo Guzman, I mean, as national risks. So uh, the argument I make is that six, one of the lessons of 68 is the danger of being dependent on foreign sources for your intelligence. And that one of the challenges to be truly sovereign and independent is to have your own intelligence apparatus that includes some US actors as a security threat for Mexico. I'm not saying that perhaps the National Rifle Association should be awarded the Aguila Azteca. I don't know. But at least it should be considered, because in that way we will discuss who will, if we consider that the Maras from Central America are a threat to Mexican security, that's reasonable. It can be what the argument. Why can we include the National Rifle Association or some other groups that are uh, harming our national interest and our people? As you can see, 68 keeps uh, teaching us lessons because uh, there are still aspects that we don't know about 68, and there are still information that deserves to be reinterpreted with new evidence, like the one I provide you about the role of Winston Scott and the CIA in the creation of the mentality in the president's mind. I mean, I'm not saying that the CIA or the Lyndon Johnson sent uh, a group of uh, assassins to, to Mexico in October 2nd. I mean, that's not the case. but. One must discuss responsibility in a broader perspective, especially when you are the neighbors, uh, when we are neighbors. Uh, and that means that uh, our securities and our threats are shared. We have a shared responsibility, and we must build a shared agenda. Uh, and for that, we must be self-sufficient in the creation of our own intelligence. Thank you. Muchas, muchas gracias. Thank you, thank you very much. I have the luxury and pleasure of being in these conversations a plenty, but I imagine many of you out in the public do not. So I invite you actually to ask questions. Sea tanto en inglés como en español. Somos bilingües, we're bilingual. If not, we could do translation. That's not an issue. I'm going to pass the microphone. This one, you have one. Perfect. It's, she's coming by. Thank you very much, uh, Emma and uh, Professor. Um, I have a question for you. How would Mexico develop a truly independent intelligence service? Of course, you know, sharing and dependent on other, a, uh, other intelligence uh, uh, agencies in other countries. First of all, how can Mexico develop such an independent intelligence service? And then how would Mexico uh, control that agency because we have the experience in the United States where the OSS, which seemed very good at the beginning, becomes then the CIA in many forms, and uh, some good, some bad, some quite evil. So how how would Mexico uh, put in checks and balances to stop the intelligence agency from taking control of the country or becoming another gang? in the war of gangs? 
I think it's, it's very simple. Actually, this week, uh, perhaps today, we will know the new plan of uh, security plan of López Obrador. This argument, I'm making this argument to his uh, team. Um, I don't know if they will consider, but the CISEN, the National Security and Investigation, is changing its, its name to the a National System of Intelligence. And um, <coughs> there are <coughs> examples all over the world of how intelligence agencies are a necessary evil and that Congress or Parliament is the best way and society are the best way to control <coughs> those agencies. As for the human resources, Mexico has now a surplus of PhDs, uh, experts in every field imaginable because the country has invested billions of dollars in sending people abroad. So that's not the problem. The problem lies in the, uh, the, the army has intelligence service, the uh, federal police, uh, the navy, and the, what, what we need now is a new intelligence service that takes a fresh look, a fresh look to, uh, to the threats, and in my, in my opinion, uh, include some American institutions that will be, and then we have to monitor them as in any democracy and hope that is not, uh, they are not misused or perverted by drug cartels or by criminals or by ambitious politicians. Doctor, un gran admirador de su trabajo en primer plano y con Aristegui. Muchas gracias por estar aquí. Dos preguntas, básicamente. Como vimos, ahora a Televisa se unió con Amazon para hacer esta serie de Extraño Enemigo que habla del 68. ¿Cómo puede leer esa, esa, ese movimiento de Televisa, ¿no? en lugar de hacerlo en Blim? La segunda pregunta es acerca de los Light Temples, de esta CIA que estuvo ahí involucrada. Actualmente, ¿cuáles serían los objetivos de la CIA? Es, por ejemplo, Manuel Bartlett fue un, un informante. Y si vamos a Wikileaks, podemos ver que Denise Dresser al menos tuvo un desayuno con la CIA. ¿Cuál sería el objetivo o cuáles serían los targets de la CIA? ¿Podrías decirlo en inglés también? Uh, I will try. So, as we know, there is uh, Televisa and Amazon, they did a partnership in order to have the series of Unknown Enemy. It, it talks about the 68 killing. And they tried to make Televisa good, which is really not a, it's like Fox. So, the second thing is about uh, the CIA. As we know, Light Temples, uh, they were involved in since Lopez Mateos and so on. So my question is about now, what is the target of the CIA? As we know, Bartlett, we, you talk about Puebla, so Bartlett, uh, they said, probably as a DA agent said, uh, Bartlett may be involved in CIA operations. Similarly, as an East Dresser, uh, as we got WikiLeaks, you can see that, at least they have a breakfast. So just my question is, what should be the new targets for that? Thank you so much. Televisa is looking for content. Everybody is looking for content. I mean, uh, and uh, the question is not that they are trying to do it, but it's the quality of, of the products they present. That's what we should look, I mean, because that's normal. And, uh, and they are following the path of Argos and Univision and Telemundo and TV Azteca. And we should expect, Mexico has opened, in that, in that regard, I mean, there, is, there are all sorts of uh, initiatives to create, there is a boom in the creation of content for the screen. And as uh, the monopolies, the old monopolies of the, that control information are breaking in pieces, then we have access to that. As for the CIA, I mean, I'm not uh, a Puritan in the sense that we are neighbors. And of course, I mean, uh, it's normal that the CIA, FBI, Navy, Army of this country have its agents. My argument is we Mexicans should have our, agent, uh, our agents as well in American territory, because that's normal. I mean. Uh, and they are looking, of course, at the cartels and the political scene, and they will try to steal <coughs> or obtain some informants. And one must distinguish the fact that uh, they meet with you with, as a scholar. <coughs> so usually they don't present as CIA agents. Then let me tell you. 
uh, in the no no they present as diplomats uh, in the 80s with lorenzo Meyer, we joke because in the 80s mexico was is a capital or was a capital of espionage after the cuban revolution and then the central american wars in the central american wars there were agents from all over the world and we joke about who had more spies. For example, a Soviet diplomat distinguished because he always called from a booth telephone in the street. He never called you from, I mean, at that time we didn't have cell phones, so it was to your office. So that's, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm not, uh, I, I like to know with whom I am speaking, but sometimes I know that the diplomat that is sitting having a coffee, he perhaps is an agent of one of the agencies. And, uh, and here comes the, the dilemma. I talk with generals, admirals, victims, activists, diplomats, because I need information. I need to understand what's going on. What, and that I feel it's acceptable. What is unacceptable is that you become a pay agent and become an informer of your colleagues uh, about their private lives out of self, petty self-interest. But other than that, if uh, an American diplomat or British or whatever, and I can tell you, I mean, the British were the most sophisticated. They had an interest in, in the war, Central American wars for Belize, that was the neighbor of Guatemala and all that. I mean, they, they, it was normal. And I don't think that the niece is an agent. I mean, when I read in the tweets, that I, I, I don't buy it. I don't, it is not the case. She's very intense and tries to understand uh, what's going on in order to write and give an opinion. Well, she has her style, I have mine, but I am very open with the, my sources. I protect my sources. And when I give, say something of the record, I say it's of the record, but never, ever, about the private lives or about, and never ever I have accepted the payment of a, for, of a government, of a foreign government or a Mexican government. And, uh, and I have been offered cash, of course, by the Mexican government, not by the, by the, by the Americans have never offered me nothing, I must say. <laughs> it is not a complaint. <laughs> The Jesuits have offered me money to come here. <laughs> are paying me my expenses. <laughs> maybe. <laughs> and maybe. <laughs> and the Jesuits have a, not a very good... Uh, <laughs> no, I'm joking. They were the spies of the Vatican at some time in, the, in Japan and China. And, um, that's part of history. It's, uh, uh, no, I mean, come on, all that is documented. It's, uh, it's normal. Hmm? Bartlett, I mean, I would like to have the time to do research on his life, but I don't have the time, really. I mean, it is that, uh, but he's a fascinating figure of the, trans of the established consolidation of the drug cartels in Mexico. Perhaps at some time, it was in the 80s when he was the Minister of Interior, when the, uh, it was discovered the assassination of Enrique Camarena in 1985 and Manuel Buendía. So it is worth looking, but I haven't had the time because each one of the characters I do research takes a lot of time, I mean, to dig information. We have time for two more questions for either speaker. Uh, this is for Professor Santa Maria. Santa, no, no, Santa. Okay. Um, in, in, I'm a labor historian. And uh, in uh, the U.S., and uh, one of the things you know, dealing with obviously communism, anti-communism, we've sort of over time understood that that uh, 
you can't take these things literally. When, when in fact, you know, you're talking about communists in the 30s or 40s or 50s, what, uh, you know, or in the Deep South, for example, you know, uh, if, you, if you would say, well, are they really communists? No, of course they aren't, but, 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 but the anti-communists will say secularists or integrationists or trade unionists are communists, and that is sort of a whole worldview. And I think um, American labor story, I mean, obviously we know this isn't technically, this isn't the case, but, but I think we've come to sort of accept this sense that yes, there's a whole, this conflict going on, and they label it communism, but it represents a kind of cosmopolitan, secular world. And I was, I was wondering if, if, that, if that enters into your, your work, and I mean, you were, you were being, you're making distinctions, you know, of uh, they weren't really members, et cetera, that kind of thing. Um, thank you. Yeah, so, um, so this is very important, right? Because uh, the, what I believe is that, I mean, during the Cold War period in Puebla, the, the efforts of the right wing and the mainstream politicians uh, to name students that were leftists and liberals, and as I said, like that changed at the end of the 1960s and the and beginning of the 70s, where they indeed embraced communism as an ideology openly. Uh, but before that, I mean, they were, I mean, really they wanted to modernize the university. I mean, like they said that the university was controlled by the Catholic Church and by the government, and it was. Uh, the university didn't have enough resources to support research or have uh, better uh, technical equipment. I mean, so I, I spoke to uh, students that were studying engineering and they were, you know, like, they were like, the extent to which we look at the Soviet Union, I mean, that's nothing, no? I mean, what we really care about is transforming and modernizing our own society, uh, democratizing Puebla politics and also the university, no? the university life. Uh, I think the, your, your mentioning uh, earlier decades made me think that in my larger project, and especially for the book manuscript that I'm preparing on lynching, uh, I do deal with a, like, like earlier roots of anti-communism in Mexico or anti-socialist ideas, which again, um, in the case of Puebla, had to do with this uh, former like Cristero, uh, uh, the people that participated in the Cristero War that were uh, opposing the secularist and modernizing forces of the of the revolutionary state, uh, and and again it's very telling that in the 1960s you continue to have this same slogan of the Cristeros because it talks about how locally rooted these ideologies are, no? and that's another point that for me is important to remember that these things have had a local history, and so and, and that's what I meant with provincializing the history of the Cold War that surely there were the reference, reference points with the United States and with the Soviet Union, and people at the time were aware of those. But really, uh, I mean, people were also making reference to, um, the, to, to symbolic and ideolo ideological roots of communism and anti-communism that had a larger history uh, in Puebla. So, so I think it, it echoes what you were saying, uh, that most surely the definition of what a communist was uh, had to do little bit uh, with, with actual communism and more with like liberal secularizing forces, both in the 1960s and earlier on uh, in the 1930s in, in Puebla and in other states of Mexico. Wonderful. One more. I guess. Yes, uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Gemma, Dr. Aguayo, congratulations uh, for your uh, <clears throat> lectures. Dr. Aguayo, I have a, I have a question. Of course, uh, um, I am a historian, so I am very uh, excited about uh, how to uh, get a better interpretation, a better, uh, well, let's say, the, the description what it happened in '68 uh, with the uh, uh, students' movement. Uh, what kind of uh, archives we have to research? The uh, Secretaría de la Defensa Archives, the Archivo General de la Nación Archives, the film that was taken October the 2nd and that was given to President Luis Echeverria, where is it, the, that film? Uh, uh, I don't know, uh, Televisa's archives, uh, how can we get a better understanding what kind of resources we have to research to have a better understanding of, uh, about what did happen. Please. Thank you. Um, 
In Mexico, the most important archive is uh, one of the, minister, the Secretary of Defense, the Army. Uh, I don't know if the Estado Mayor Presidencial or the, uh, kept files. That I, I don't think, as far as I know, they destroyed everything. Uh, as far as the film that was uh, made on that night, it was destroyed on October 3rd, according to Echeverria. Oh, no, no Echeverria, the filmmaker. He delivered the films, the six, because he had six cameras all around the, 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 the square. And um, he delivered that to the Fed Directorate of Federal Security, and they destroyed those films. Uh, but we know already almost everything about 68, with the exception of the archives of the Ministry of Defense. Now, the angle that has not been researched enough is uh, the foreign angle, the role of the international community. I think we have to work at a lot still in the, for example, the CIA uh, files or the American ar ar archives have still a lot to offer about 68. Cuba, Russia, England. I think those countries have a lot in their, in their vaults that can help to understand what happened in uh, their role in 68. I have worked in the, actually here in Chicago, I work in Illinois in the archives of Avery Brundish, who was the head of the uh, Olympic Committee in 68, and his archives are here, in, uh, very near uh, Champaign, Illinois. Uh, fascinating archives to understand the role of the Olympic, uh, um, the, uh, the Olympic angle. A colleague, uh, Ariel uh, Rodriguez Curi, is going to come with a book later this year mm -hmm. about the Olympics. And he has worked on the archives in, in Geneva. I went to Geneva, but only to look at specific things. He has really gone deeper into that. So it keeps coming information. I mean, I just saw the book. I learned about this book. I'm going to read it. That's not a, it is one of the best stu uh, events studied in the case of Mexico. We need to go deeper in many other events. In the case of organized crime, there is a clear link between 68 and the consolidation of organized crime in Mexico. That I can already, already tell you. I mean, I have the evidence to show how that happened, but that's another story. Well, thank you. Muchas, muchas gracias. As you can see, we need more time. Yes. And you will have an opportunity to speak to both of them. I know there's another session in 15 minutes. Is that correct? 15, 15 so there's a few minutes here. And my apologies for, for the man with the, with, with the glasses. Um, bueno, buenas tardes de nuevo. I joked with uh, Professor Doc, uh, Dr. Sergio Aguayo Quesada, que se quede. Stay. Stay here. <laughs> no, I think it would be wonderful. So I hope that this is the first of many conversations that include voices that are binational, trinational, uh, uh, transnational, my apologies. And also, it's, it's a formal introduction to our new Latin Americanist Mexicanista, Dr. Gemma Santa Maria, and we're all very excited. Así que muchas gracias. Muchas gracias. Muchas gracias.